The Tom Woods Show, episode 1181. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, this episode is brought to you by Indochino. This week, my listeners can get any premium Indochino suit for just $379 at Indochino.com when entering Woods at checkout. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. Larry Correa is back with us again. We had him on episode 1101 to talk about guns and gun violence, and that was excellent because Larry knows an enormous amount about that and also because he has a personality, and those two factors put together give you one heck of a guest. Well, today we're going to be talking about Larry's own field. Larry, of course, is a New York Times bestselling novelist known for his Monster Hunter and Grim Noir Chronicles series. He has a tremendous and very devoted following, and I want to talk about what's going on in the area of sci-fi and fantasy where there's been some, you know, what you might call SJW shenanigans going on where people who aren't in the SJW camp are getting their names dragged through the mud with the usual accusations with which we are grimly familiar from all other areas of life. And in fact, Larry was recently disinvited from a rather important conference for really no good reason other than ideological fanaticism. So I want to check in with him and see what is going on in this area. Larry, welcome back. Thanks for having me on. The gun episode we did last time just couldn't have been better. Everybody loved it. Now I want to talk about something that is even more in your wheelhouse, so to speak, and that is the writing that you do and the genre in which you do it because it seems as if there is some kind of a cultural battle going on. (laughs) I wonder if you can give us a bird's eye overview of for the uninitiated. Sure. Um, yeah, we've had some, some recent controversies, but this really started uh, several years ago. Um, for, for your listeners that, that don't know me, uh, I'm, a, I'm a novelist and uh, I'm a New York Times bestselling writer. I write science fiction and fantasy. And uh, I'm also an out-of-the-closet uh, libertarian. <laughs> and uh, I am a gun nut and I used to own a gun store. When I first started in this business about 10 years ago, um, I got nominated for this prestigious award that's it's called the Campbell Award and it's for the best new author. And as soon as I got nominated, there was this great big controversy on the internet about how awful it was that this horrible right wing hate monger um, who's probably homophobic and transphobic and uh, racist and sexist. And he owned a gun store and guns killed children. <laughs> well, so in other words, really high level intellectual stuff. In other words, super, super honest and uh, not at all disingenuous. And uh, one of my favorite comments somebody made was if I win this award, it will end literature forever. Of course. <laughs> what other consequence could there be? Sure. I mean, really? Yeah. So uh, what happened was um, I, I went, it was called world con is the big event. And it's part of the Hugo awards, which are at the time were considered the big prestige award that they claimed represented all of fandom. It represented everybody who liked science fiction and fantasy. And it was a chance for all of us to kind of come together and decide what we thought was the best. So when I went to this event, um, I mean, I knew I was going to lose before I ever got there just because the reaction before anybody had read my books, they just had decided based upon who I was that I you know, didn't deserve it. But then I went and I saw how the sausage got made and, it was really horrible because what I came away with is like, it was so incredibly super biased. It was so political and it was just a bunch of, um, clicks and there was various, and they were all left wing. Um, pretty much you couldn't, at the time it was, uh, you know, Barack Obama. I was like, you wouldn't find anybody there who wasn't a Barack Obama voter. And if they voted for uh, John McCain, by golly, they're keeping their heads down. (laughs) And, uh, it was just interesting to me because it was so political and no one actually cared about the books. No one cared about the awards or no, they cared about the awards, but no one cared about the actual books or what the books said or how entertaining they were. It was all about politics. It was all about, did these people have the right politics and did the book have the right message? And that's what it came down to is like, if they were popular with the certain clicks. So what happened was a, a couple of years later, my career was doing really good and I looked at this tiny insular group and I thought, you know, if I got more, I called them wrong fans. Cause we like to have wrong fun. 
if I got more wrong fans involved, we could probably get some people who weren't liberal nominated for awards. So <laughs> is, is this where the, the sad puppies came from? That's how sad puppies was born. And uh, it caused so much outrage. Uh, this went on for a few years. We got a ton of people nominated that, um, that weren't, they were, they were outsiders. They weren't part of the in crowd. You understand this industry, um, when they do, you know, those little surveys of industries to see how they swing politically, uh, other than liberal is so small that it's a statistical blip. Um, so any chart that has the publishing industry will be have like 99% liberal, uh, or socialist or left wing. It, it, non, uh, uh, that's just how it is. So when I got a bunch of people that were outsiders nominated for these awards, it was the end of the world. The next thing I knew, there was articles showing up in places like Entertainment Weekly, um, all these national news blogs, places that had never before mentioned the Hugo Awards ever. And they all all running on the same script that this was an assault by racist, sexist, hate mongers who were trying to keep publishing white and male because we hated diversity. Yeah. <laughs> It was insane. Well, the funny thing is, too, well, we, we picked our nominees, uh, the people that we pushed for awards, based upon uh, whether they had good, fun, entertaining stories, as opposed to boring, preachy, political message fic. So it actually turned out that our nominees were way more diverse than the people that you normally want. This is the same crowd that the year before, they had 14 white liberals and one Asian liberal win the award and they hailed it as a huge victory for diversity. Of course. <laughs> of course. You can't make this stuff up and it's like they're all talking you're right. It's like a template they all have. They just and they don't need to fill in many blanks, just your name. They already have the indictment written up. They already know everything they need to know about you. Even though they've never read a word you've written, never listened to a word you've said, they already know everything about you. Yep. And it's a horrible story that my fans have had a lot of fun with this over the years because um, we call it straw Larry. So they're not mad at Larry. Oh, they're that's not mad at me funny. and anything I've actually said. <laughs> yeah, it's straw Larry because straw Larry is a monster. That guy's horrible. <laughs> I don't know if he's as bad as straw Tom. You should hear people can't stand straw Tom, but real oh, that Tom. Guy's worse. Oh, isn't he? <laughs> but real Tom seems to be an okay guy. It's just, yeah. just a funny mix up apparently between the two people. Tell me about origins. What is origins and what happened to you? Well, so that was this year. So for the last couple of years, I really haven't done much um, politically. I've kind of been retired from taking off people in the publishing world. So I kind of, you know, moved past this and forgot about it. I had been invited to be the guest of honor at Origins Gaming Convention in Columbus, Ohio. It's one of the big uh, conventions. I've also done a lot of work in the gaming industry. I have a couple of games out based upon books that I've written. Uh, and I'm, a, I'm an avid tabletop war gamer. I, I paint miniatures for fun. Um, so I, I'm the kind of person that makes perfect sense to have as a guest. I have a lot of fans. It would be a draw. So they invited me out. Sure, that sounds great. I agreed to be a guest. We had no problems for months. I talked about it going back clear to February. I think it was the first time I announced I was going to be the guest of honor there. And uh, then the day the Origins put it on their Facebook page to announce me, um, some people showed up and pitched this giant fit. Uh, I was an internet outrage mob formed up and, uh, started screaming. It was all the same old stuff, uh, baseless allegations with no evidence. No one could ever quote me. And this one lady that started it all was talking about how I had personally attacked and harmed her loved ones. I'll come back to this cause it's, it's hilarious. Um, so this all happens. And within about an hour and a half or two hours, the guy in charge of Origins, a fellow named John Ward, revoked my invitation and they disinvited me as their guest of honor. And the best part is he posted it on Facebook is where I saw it first. Uh, and I got an email at the same time, apparently, but it was just a cut and paste of what he said on Facebook. And it was something to the effect of... They, they, when they invited me, they didn't know about my dangerous opinions that made me inappropriate for this family-friendly event. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. So, you, you can't be around families, Larry. That's dangerous for people. I know. I'm at, what's the funny thing is I've actually got a bunch of kids. I don't know if they realize how dangerous I am, but, you know, <laughs> I'm pretty boring, actually. No, so 
I, I was like, what? What are my super dangerous opinions I have? I, I actually wrote an uh, essay about this on my blog. I went through the timeline and every detail and cited all the emails and everything. So that's all on my blog if anyone's interested. But um, I asked the guy, like, what are my dangerous opinions that, that make me inappropriate for this event? And they never, ever, ever cited anything. And then here's the kicker. This is where it comes. This is where it's really fascinating. The person that started all this, the person that threw this big fit, well, first off, she wasn't going to the event anyway. She wasn't even going to be there. She felt unsafe on behalf of others, as social justice warriors tend to do. But here's the best part. The person that I, her family member that I personally attacked and offended, four years ago, this guy wrote an article about how a different gaming con, a different gaming convention has 50,000 members and how they're all racist and how this con is racist and how he went to this con and uh, felt uncomfortable. And then he went into all of his hangups from when he was a teenager and people were racist to him. Okay. And I went through his article line by line and just pointed out all the, all the logical fallacies. And that was, that wasn't even that mean really, but he was just basically full of crap. Here's the best part. He's the son of a billionaire. The guy is a billionaire heir. So I have more privilege than the heir of a billionaire. Apparently my Portuguese dairy farmer privilege was so dangerous that I made these people unsafe. Um, yeah. And so she held a grudge for four years. This was her fiance. Uh -huh. So she held a grudge for four years and then uh, had to get origins to kick me out. So and good they, times. They folded right away. They didn't, as usual, they didn't even contact you and say, Hey, is any of this true? No, they didn't bother. Well, and here's, here's another thing too, which is really interesting. The gaming industry is a lot like the publishing industry in that it, um, it's, it's divided, but everyone thinks it's overwhelmingly liberal because the only people who can openly speak are liberals or left wingers. So most people just, you know, anybody who's not keeps their head down, keeps their opinion yourself because as this was going on, a whole bunch of game companies, it came out, um, had also been pressuring or, or member or employees of certain game companies had also been pressuring origins about what a horrible right wing hate monger of Haiti hate hate I am and how I shouldn't be there. So you have a bunch of representatives of other companies in the industry colluding to keep a competitor out because of his political opinions. And they're dumb enough to crow about it on Twitter. So that, it's just the nature of this industry. And it kind of sends a message to everybody who doesn't toe the line that if you go against the accepted group thing, they're going to destroy you. They're going to attack you. They're going to make stuff up about you and they're going to run you out of town on a rail. So it's kind of sad. It helps. I mean, it helps in your case that you're already an established author. You have a really dedicated following, but it certainly sends a message to that upstart, that up and comer that you better watch out because if you don't have that built in audience, you'll be ruined before you get started. Yeah. So about 10 years ago when I started all of this, where I started just being loud and I was being the nail that would stick up, it was because I could get away with it. My book sales were doing really good. Um, I was one of the best selling authors in Baghdad and Bagram to give you an idea <laughs> during the war. Wow. That's, well, I mean, it's just, that's my fan base. My, uh, I really like the joke. My fan base has killed more people than cancer. <laughs> There's, I mean, I'm really popular among soldiers, cops, uh, guys that work hard for a living, you know, uh, I go to my book signings and I come away with a, you know, pocket full of challenge coins from a bunch of different units. And so my fans are guys like that. They don't care. They, and uh, so when the publishing industry like smears me and, and writes articles about me, my people don't read Entertainment Weekly. They don't care what IO9 has to say. They're just looking for a good time. And, uh, you know, they're used to getting lied about too. So I was pretty safe. I started rocking the boat. Um, and they came after me. It was kind of fun. They kept pronouncing my career irreparably ruined. They kept saying how I ruined my reputation and no one would respect me anymore. I was going to be a failure. And it's so funny because I'm actually kind of a private person. I don't like to brag about my success, but I do simply because it makes these people so angry. Yeah. Oh, that's why I do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. I mean, we're building a new house right now. We bought a big chunk of property out in the country on a, on a mountainside and, and we're building a big, nice house. And I just built a giant shooting range for myself. And I keep putting up construction photos of all this as I go, just because I know it irks them so bad. They keep saying that I'm ruined, yet I keep selling books. And that was obviously wishful thinking on their part. 
Yeah, because they, they well, well, the thing is, that 10 years ago, people really were under the impression they could ruin you. Um, so if you went against accepted groupthink, they would ruin you. And part of the thing back then is there were these publishing gatekeepers. There was only a handful of ways to get published. And if you weren't published through a handful of these publishing houses, you were just stuck. Then along came the ebook revolution and Amazon, and it really opened up the market and opened up distribution channels. So all of a sudden people could get their entertainment product out in front of different audiences without having to go through all these Manhattan gatekeepers. And it was really kind of the beginning of the end for these people. And they're getting louder and shriller because they've lost control of the publishing industry. Um, now pretty much anybody, regardless of what your politics are, you can get your book out there and you can get it in front of an audience. Now I'm lucky in that my, pu- I, I'm with a traditional publishing house, but my publisher doesn't care. She is awesome. She publishes everybody from uh, me to Tom Crapman, who's probably the most right wing Republican you'll ever meet all the way to Eric Flint, who's a Trotskyite communist. Um, so my publishing house just doesn't care as long as you entertain readers and sell books. They're happy to have you. But everywhere else, if you had the wrong politics, they would ruin you. They would not advertise you. They would, uh, you have one contract and then you'd come out, you'd voted for George Bush, and the next thing you know, you wouldn't get any more contracts. Um, there was a handful of guys that could get away with being outspoken um, just because they were so successful. Orson Scott Card's a good example. He's at probably one of the most left-wing publishing houses there is. I mean, ha- half their employees are gender study majors from Vassar, but uh, he, um, he, they publish him because he makes them a lot of money. But for most people, they'd have a book or two, they'd come out of the closet, they'd slip up and have a wrong political opinion, and their careers were shot. So... It, it's, it's been, it's been nice. It's been changing. It's, it's been nice to have it change so dramatically over the last few years. It sounds like most of this doesn't directly have anything to do with the books or stories themselves. It looks like they ferret out some private opinion that you may have, or indeed may not have. They just attribute it to you. But is there any way in which this cultural battle that's going on in your field does manifest itself in the books themselves and the kind of themes in uh, whatever. I mean, maybe is it that some people are emphasizing more traditional heroism and others are doing SJW stuff. What's actually going on in the literature itself? Oh, that's actually really interesting. Um, One of the things with said puppies is we were going through and we started pointing out that a lot of the stuff that was popular for awards was not popular with the people. Because the stuff that's popular for the awards, the stuff that got pushed as being big and important was because it had the message. It had the preaching. We, we, we joked about, we called it the dying polar bears genre. Because for a while there, everything was global warming. So we're like, the key to winning awards was you got to have dying polar bears. <laughs> and so what happened though is it was also damaging our business because a lot of readers, a lot of longtime readers were just drifting away. Because everything that was getting marketed to them, everything that was in their face was all politics all the time. Then you got guys like me who have reputations. We're just, they call us pulp writers because we care about entertainment. We care about action, adventure, fun. We, we want to get emotion. We want to get, you know, catharsis. We want to get all that cool stuff in the book. And, and all, if, if we have a message, if there's a political message, it comes way down the line. So I put entertainment first. And if I sneak a message in there, you don't even know it. Whereas a lot of this stuff would just beat you over the head with message. Like you look at the marketing and you can always tell because if you look at the, the blurb of the book or the marketing that's put out by the publishing house to try to sell the book, if it accentuates like exploding spaceships or magic or dragons or excitement or fun or quest adventure, you know, it's probably going to be like what they consider a pulpy novel where we're just going for that. If right in the beginning it starts talking about, um, somebody's cis heteronormative comes to conclusions in this bold new non-binary gender world, or, you know, the, the villain is a thinly veiled version of Dick Cheney. And, uh, it's, it's just very preachy. That's, that's kind of like the other side of the aisle. They put message over entertainment. And, uh, I tell you what was killing us too is cause we're not just competing against books. We're competing against television. We're competing against video games. We're competing against streaming services. It's just entertainment. And so these social justice people weren't just hosing themselves because honestly, most of them, their sales are garbage. They were hosing the rest of us and the entire publishing industry because they're chasing off fans with their preachy 
boring, literati, pretentious twaddle. So, how have yeah, they been I able to that answers that question? Yeah, sure. But how have they been able to position themselves in a place where they can lecture people like you and look down their noses at people like you when you outsell them and outperform them? How did they get into this position where they can be the judges of the world? Well, it's, it's, it honestly, it's, it's, a, it's a question of history. So if you look at the history of the publishing industry, it is overwhelmingly been located in Manhattan. Um, and over time, the people who have gravitated to working in it have overwhelmingly been the same basic demographic. Uh, it's been uh, people who went to school with each other. They all, everybody they go to parties with has the same opinion. Everyone they work with has the same opinion. Everyone they associate with, everyone they went to school with, they all believe the same way. And over time, it just became more and more and more of an echo chamber. Like my publisher moved out of North, or my parent publisher moved out of New York City and moved to North Carolina because it's cheaper. Uh, that's probably why, why they're still sane. But um, so you had the echo chamber effect. And then the other side on the, on the fan side, you had Worldcon, which considered itself like, or advertised itself as this representative bastion of, of everything. But it tended to be overwhelmingly liberal too. And liberal thought, left-wing thought could be expressed freely and applauded. But anybody who expressed something other than that got attacked because they weren't representative of the community or whatever it is. So it's just kind of an insidious thing where a lot of times libertarians and conservatives aren't super combative or they used to not be as combative. So when they start getting pushed out of a place and the place was no longer fun, they wouldn't fight for it. They would just go, they take their money somewhere else. So that's kind of what we've seen. So on the fan side, it's just, they ruined the fun, so our people kind of just moved on to do other stuff. Or they just didn't gravitate towards that industry anymore because who wants to work with a bunch of, you know, 25-year-old uh, women that just got out of college who think they know everything in the world about books? So that's just kind of been the nature of it. They, it's, it's, it's been a gradual thing, but it's also been for a long time that this industry has been so left. Unfortunately, like a lot of entertainment. Well, what about the possibility of having a conference or an organization or something, some kind of association of writers or whatever that bills itself expressly as the non-thought control organization? You know, you just come here, you write stories, and we're all happy about it, and we don't try to look through your garbage to see what you've been reading or whatever. You know, we just leave you alone because that's none of our friggin' business. Yeah. You know, the thing is there has been some stuff started up, um, as far as organizations, I couldn't really tell you about any in particular though. Cause I've not, I've not joined any of them. There are some cons, there are some events that are very much apolitical, uh, that have done a really good job staying apolitical. Um, and so there are, are some out there. So basically anything that's not explicitly left wing, they will kind of take over over time. But anything that's expressly apolitical and the people in charge fight to keep it apolitical, it's been good. I'll give you an example. Um, after I got kicked out of Origins, the, um, the angry mob people behind it started trying to get me kicked out of another convention. So they were over on Twitter and they were, you know, colluding and talking about how dangerous voices like me. And well, right before this, another writer, uh, John Ringo, who's actually kind of a moderate Republican, I think. Uh, John Ringo got kicked out of uh, Con Carolinas because of the same outrage mob. So somebody was over on Twitter talking about how dangerous voices of abusers such as me and John Ringo shouldn't be invited to Dragon Con. Uh, now, Dragon Con is a 80,000 person event that takes over downtown Atlanta for three days. It is a huge party. If you've been to Mardi Gras and Dragon Con, Dragon Con's a bigger party. I'm not joking. So it's, it's nerd Mardi Gras. So Dragon Con sees this, and this person that's trying to get me and John Ringo kicked out is one of their track directors. Uh, in fact, it's the track director of their fantasy track, which is funny because me and John Ringo are so far the only winners of the Dragon Award for Best Fantasy. <laughs> it's been around for two years. So she's trying to get us kicked out. Dragon Con does not play that game. They are a business. They are professionals. They run it like a business, and they are expressly apolitical, so everyone is welcome. Dragon Con fired her. They uh, they removed her as their track director and replaced her with somebody who who wasn't going to do that kind of thing. They just put their foot down and said, "Nope, 
we're not going to go the direction of these other guys. We are not going to get woke and go broke. So there are some cons out there that are doing the right thing. Uh, Con Carolinas was the one that uh, John Ringo had to drop out of because of all the threats and from the social justice warriors. They made a very bold statement at the, their closing ceremonies this year. They said, look, we will never, ever give in to a political outrage mob again. If you are offended by a guest we've already invited, we'll gladly refund your money. That's just how it is. But we're not going to bow to internet pressures. We're not going to like throw people out without evidence of actual wrongdoing. And so right after they did that, the social justice warriors immediately launched a petition to get those people in charge of that convention uh, removed. That's the, well, here's the funny thing. David Weber, a famous author, started a counter petition. So the social justice petition got like, I want to say it was like 130 signatures and uh, to remove the people that stood up for free speech. And then the author petition in favor of free speech, I think it got 3,500 <laughs> in, the, in the deadline. So it was like 30, 30 something to one in favor of free speech over social justice, which is, which is pretty indicative, I think, of, of how this discussion is nationally. And these people are super loud and super offended, but they're really not that many, but people listen to them because they think they're many. Larry, let's pause just a minute for a brief message to my folks to remind everybody that, like it or not, the way you dress leaves an impression on people. And one of the ways a good suit can be differentiated from a bad one is simply the fit. A bad one looks baggy, looks like you're heading into court on a B&E charge or something. You don't want that. That's not the image you want. Ideally, you want a made-to-measure suit, but you figure there's no way you can afford that. But now you can with Indochino. They make suits and shirts to your exact measurements for a great fit. You get a wide selection of high-quality fabrics. You can personalize all the details, including your lapel, lining, and monogram. So you just go to a showroom or go to Indochino.com. You pick your fabric, your customizations, you submit your measurements, and then you wait for your custom suit to arrive in just a few weeks. Well, this week, my listeners can get any premium Indochino suit for just $379 at Indochino.com when entering Woods at checkout. That's 50% off the regular price for a made-to-measure premium suit. Plus, shipping is free. The whole process is super easy. I found it very intuitive. You're going to love it. So it's Indochino.com, promo code Woods, for any premium suit for just $379 and free shipping. That is an incredible deal for a suit that will fit you better than anything off the rack ever could. Now, Larry, I don't want to second guess your judgment. You know your industry better than I do. But I'll just tell you that when I find myself the subject of an attack, I turn it to my favor in one way or another. I used to just ignore it, think, ah, you know, these people just let them stew. I don't care. But you know what? It's too good of an opportunity to pass up. If somebody disinvited me from an event of that scale, I would get that camera turned on. I would look into that camera and make a YouTube video that overnight would have 50,000 views and that would build up my tribe. It's an opportunity not to be missed. When they do that to you, they're handing you an opportunity on a silver platter that you ought to grab. Don't you think? Oh, totally. Honestly, what I've seen with these people is every time they try to attack my career, it's like throwing, it's throwing water on a duck. You know, it's throwing fertilizer on a weed. It, it doesn't, Every time they, I lose a person because they've heard about what a horrible racist hate monger I am, I gain two readers who know that these people are full of crap and they'll check my books out and see that they're actually pretty entertaining. Um, and one of the things I actually, I, a lot of people, they think that, you know, we're losing the culture war or, or something of that nature. They think the social justice people are winning and ruining free speech. I actually disagree. I think what's happening is these people have become increasingly shrill and angry. Um, and cause like their latest attacks have just been asinine. They've been asinine to anybody who's got even an iota of critical thinking skill. Um, they're, they're really at this point, these people are only convincing people who are already true believers who, who already smear you no matter what. I think what we're seeing though, is they're losing their power. They're not as powerful as they once were. People are now aware of their games. And this is the thing that I like they're getting mocked. They're getting made fun of. They're getting laughed at. And if you know bullies, the one thing a bully cannot stand is getting laughed at. Um, so now these people attack me and they'll get some little cowardly type, like the guy that runs origins to immediately cave and be a big wuss. But what, what happens is he's the one that looks like the goon. He's the guy that looks like the loser. 
And I come out of this and I'll probably sell, you know, another 10 or 20,000 books to new people who are like, wow, that sounds like BS. I'm going to go look this guy up on Amazon. And, uh, it used to be like, the, like we mentioned earlier, the small guys, the guys who are just starting out. They'd be really worried about their careers getting ruined. And that used to be the case. But now it's like if a bunch of social justice warriors form up an outrage mob to attack you or attack your company and you don't back down, if you stand your ground and you just are honest, you will more than make up for the loss of business that those social justice warriors are going to cause. And uh, I think as more people catch on, the better off will be. The problem we have is that a lot of people who drink the Kool-Aid, um, when the social justice warriors come after them, they immediately capitulate. They apologize for stuff they haven't done wrong. They beg forgiveness. It's kind of like the Soviet union, everybody signing their confessions before they get executed by the commissars, you know, of all their crimes against the state. It's like the Jack Dorsey from Twitter. Uh, he got photographed eating Chick-fil-A. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And so the next thing you know, I mean, and the guy's apology. Here's the thing, dude, you're a billionaire. You are worth more money than some countries. You don't have to apologize to these people because you ate a chicken sandwich. Yeah. I mean, totally absurd. Yeah. Yeah. Totally absurd. Especially when the reasons people don't like Chick fil A, almost none of them hold anymore. They're still, you know, but they, they just won't, they won't uh, let go of a grudge. Your point about laughter as the way to go after these people is so right. And I know I'm going to irritate a few people by saying this, but it's a fact that the other day, you know, when at the Tony Awards, Robert De Niro said F Trump. Yeah. And that was really courageous because he said that to a room, every single person of in there agreed with him already. So, wow. what yeah, a so brave. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's just, I'm so bold, bold over by this, but. Then Michelle Malkin came out with a response, a video response that's all over Facebook. It's been viewed millions of times. So, you know, maybe what do I know? But I thought that was so ineffective. I mean, yeah, people watched it because it was a response to him. It was so ineffective because she looks in the camera and she comes off like this humorless scold. Like, thank you so much for showing that Hollywood is so intolerant, just as we... And I thought, that's not how you respond. You laugh at the guy. Because yeah. laughter is going to sting if you just lecture him that, you know, you just proved that you people aren't conservative. Like, we... That, that's a terrible response. You should laugh at the guy. You should say, well, what's your next, is your next speech going to be against cancer? You're going to come out boldly against cancer next time? Or <laughs> may, maybe the next day you'll be in favor of sunny days or whatever. Uh, you know, whatever. Just something to laugh at him. But you don't just hector him. That, then you're just, you're blowing the whole opportunity. And plus you make yourself look like the caricature of conservatives, that they're humorless and, yeah. you, you know, they're, they're fuddy-duddies. Don't live down to that expectation. Well, one of the things that I mean, my, my people had so much fun, and I think one of the things that drives the social justice warriors nuts, specific about me and my fan base, is that we're gleeful. We're, we're, you can honestly tell as this stuff is going on um, that we're just having a good time. Like when I just said puppies, my spokesman was a cartoon manatee. It was Wendell the manatee was literally our spokesman <laughs> for like equality in literature. Okay. Um, you know, and so all this recently. And the thing is these people kind of always project too. So the stuff that they're saying about you is kind of what they're going, what, what they're feeling. You ever notice that when these people, like you could be having a good time and laughing and joking and making fun of what happened and, and just uh, having fun. And their response will always be, wow, you sound angry. You're so upset. This must've hit a nerve. And, <laughs> and it's like, um, no, actually I'm doing fine. But um, yeah. So I think the key is, is have fun. And the people in the middle, the great undecided, you know, um, when I, when I do these things, when I argue with these people, when I get in these fights, I'm not doing it for myself and I'm not doing it for them. Cause I don't ever expect to sway any of these true believers. Um, I do it for my fans so I can give them ammunition and I do it for the undecided. I, I put this all out there. That way the people in the middle can look and then decide for themselves. And so that's why we have fun. That's why we write entertaining books. That's why we're all about, you know, the joy. Um, like we said, we used to make these little ribbons that says wrong fan having wrong fun. Because the thing about social justice warriors is the idea that somewhere out there, someone is having fun in an unapproved manner just infuriates them. So the best thing you can do is just have fun. You know, have fun with it. Like yeah, I got no kicked kidding. out of this con. I stayed home. I, I, so I went and did uh, the things I would have normally done anyway. I had fun. I took, oh, we actually ate at Chick-fil-A. 
<laughs> and then went to the game store and, and played games. Um, cause my kids were supposed to come with me. So they, we just went and did other stuff. We had a good time. So, you know, I figured let them, let them cry, let them freak out. And the more they do it, the more people can see their liars. Biggest difference, honestly, in my, what I've seen in difference between people who believe in free speech and people who don't, the people who don't believe in free speech will do everything in their power to silence you. And the people who do believe in free speech want the other side to keep talking so that everyone can see how full of crap they are. So, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep enjoying myself. Larry, how do people follow you online and see you enjoying yourself? Um, let's see. If they're on Facebook, we have the uh, the Monster Hunter International Facebook um, Facebook group. It's called uh, Monster Hunter International Hunters Unite. Uh, Monster Hunter International is my first book. Um, they can find all my stuff on Amazon. I have a blog. It's uh, MonsterHunterNation.com, where I, I uh, don't blog as often as I used to, but it, it's either politics or book stuff or, uh, or nerdy hobby gamer stuff or guns. <laughs> so, uh, so they can follow me on monsterhunternation.com or find me on Facebook on the monster hunter Facebook page. Um, that was the best way to get home. All my books are available at Barnes and Noble bookstores everywhere and on Amazon. Excellent. Okay. So we'll link to all this stuff at tomwoods.com slash 1181. And Larry, as always, thanks for your time and great to hear about how you're doing. Cool. Thanks, Tom. I appreciate it. All right, folks, don't forget to join me in New Orleans June 30th for the Mises Caucus Take Human Action Bash. These are the good folks who are doing good and important work in the Libertarian Party, and we want to support them at this event. So whatever you need to do to get there, do that thing and get there. Find out more at TakeHumanAction.com. Also, I was just reading the news the other day, Bernie Sanders is refusing to endorse his own son, who is running for House of Representatives. Not because they disagree, because he obviously has the same boring, predictable opinions as his father, uh, the son does, but he claims he doesn't believe in political dynasties and whatever else. But no matter how you slice it, that's pretty cold. So anyway, Bernie's still in the news. There's still some speculation that he may run again for 2020. So get a jump on this one. I've got an ebook called Bernie Sanders is Wrong. And it's it's not like one of these typical free ebooks you get online where it's 15 pages and triple spaced and 48 point font. This is a real live book over 150 pages long, packed with answers to Bernie's arguments. And you may think, but who needs answers to these arguments? Well, you do because half your friends are supporting him and they have no idea what they're talking about. So you can get this free ebook over at BernieIsWrong.com or if you're in the United States, you can text the name Bernie to the number 33444 and you'll also get it that way. Thanks for listening. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free and we'll see you next time.